Well, Kevin, thank you very much for joining me with a conversation. And I thought we'd focus on freedom. You've done some very deep thinking about freedom. I'm one of those people who fears that we may be allowing our hard-won freedoms to slip away. Your observations on where Britain and the West are going are, I think, extraordinarily interesting. We're in Oxford. There have been a lot of thought and a lot of blood spilt in this place as people have sought freedom. Are we worthy heirs? Where are we? What's happening? John, the first thing anyone would want to do would be to define freedom, because my, my freedom to do something usually involves constraining somebody else. Um, but, but, but let's just take freedom for the moment to mean uh, freedom to talk and to think and, and to act within the law, uh, as we've enjoyed doing in our culture for a while. There's a crisis coming, and, and many of us think that we're about to lose those freedoms in a drastic way. Um, I thought for a while that my mental health might be impaired. I thought, I wonder if I've become a bit neurotic and paranoid. Why, why am I so anxious? Why, there's no doubt at all there's a correlation between, um, b between sort of future doom and, 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 and poor mental illness. So I rather hoped almost I might, I might be suffering from poor mental illness. But as the years have gone by, uh, the good news for me is that I'm quite well and sane. The bad news for society is that we're in very real trouble. And um, what's worse is that those of us who are standing up and saying we're in real trouble are being shouted down or ignored and people, or, or just people can't hear. So th that's a cause of real, of real concern. So the people who are winning the war say there's no war? Absolutely. The, the fact the people who are winning the war are more clever than that. Uh, they say that if people like us or me are listened to, um, there'll be a war. Um, so it, it, it's almost as if you're being sort of slowly ambushed. And then uh, if you don't lie down and give up, they say, well, there'll be a fight. <laughs> and you say, yes, but if, I, but if I don't stand up and, and fight, I'll be overcome. Never mind that, they say, you're going to be overcome anyway. And the trouble is we are going to be overcome anyway. We've got to the point in Europe, in my judgment now, where the battle for freedom has, is, is lost. Um, just imagine for a moment that, that all the people who've been calling out warnings about public censorship, about uh, the diminution of choices, about uh, the whole censorship through legislation with hate crime and so on, um, that the whole ludicrous, uh, seriously, uh, mentally and intellectually flawed phobia um, pressures that come on people. Imagine we were all listened to for a moment and we said we'd like our country and our culture back. Well, we might get it back through a civil war, which would be a dreadful, dreadful thing to happen. But, but that would be the only way we'd get it back. Uh, and if, if there's not going to be a civil war, then we certainly won't get it back because we're involved in a power struggle and the people who have, are taking away our freedom, uh, taking away the opportunity for discourse, who are changing the meaning of words under our noses, they're not going to give us our power back. Um, without a fight and, and quite clearly at the, at the moment there's no sign there's going to be a fight apart from those of us who are standing up uh, trying to tell the truth in the public space and being both shouted down and, and actually even being, being threatened with the law. Let's explore this idea then a little of the foundational freedoms. Um, some people say that, in many ways, that's very relevant here in Oxford because blood was shed by people who held a minority view and that perhaps freedom is best de defined by saying that we don't discriminate against people who hold a minority view. Apart from anything else, it's not very sensible because one day they might be in the majority. So that freedom of conscience, the right to hold to a minority view and not face sanction for it, mob sanction or government sanction, and I suppose government usually follows the mob in a democracy. Is that the essence of uh, our essential freedom, that right <coughs> to disagree, to hold a minority view and to speak to it? it? It is in part, but I would say that's a symptom of our freedom rather than the freedom itself. Um, so at the risk of being simplistic, um, I, I'd like to draw a picture. It'll be, it'll be a very blunt picture and people will jump up and down and say, well, for goodness sake, that, that's much too shallow. But we have to start somewhere. So let, let's draw the picture and then we can redefine it. Uh, to my mind, there's a triangulated conflict taking place at the moment between three major ideological forces. Uh, there is Islam, the, the cultural Marxism or, or secularism, they're merging into the same thing, and the Judeo-Christian tradition. 
Now the first two deal in power. So is, Islam deals in power, it's about submission. Here is the will of God and you please God and you, and you please the caliphate by doing as you're told. Uh, and the Quran is imposed and Sharia law is, is imposed. Um, the interesting thing about secularism or cultural Marxism is that it's, um, it's a cousin of the, Ju the Judeo-Christian tradition. Uh, it's, the, it's the vision of people who like what the Bible promises at the end, but don't want to go through God to get there. So they like the utopianism, they like the perfect society, they like, they like the end result where, where the poor will be fed, where they're naked clothed, where people will have tears wiped from their eyes and there'll be peace. But, but they want to do it themselves. Well, we all like that. We all, well, we, we do, but they don't want to go through God to get there. So um, starting with the French Revolution, this utopian movement said, well, we can do this on our own terms. We don't have to listen to the Bible. We don't have to pay attention to, to Jesus or to any other follower. We can just use our common sense because apart from anything else, humanity has the potential to, to pull the goods, uh, the rabbit out of the, of the, the hat. Um, and what we've seen since, since 1779 uh, is that actually um, the original story, the Christian, Judeo-Christian story, that humanity is flawed, appears to be true. Because every time the secular uh, left, the progressives try and build utopia, they do it at the cost of uh, uh, unimaginable uh, murder. So the French Revolution itself was an immensely bloody act. Uh, it was followed, of course, by the Russian Revolution. Uh, Mao Zedong killed something like 90 million people. Stalin's purges killed 40 million people. The blood strain, the blood strewn trail of progressive socialism is, is, is deep in blood. And, and it never succeeded. I mean, they say, well, give us more time or give us better conditions or more people need to be part of the project. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but it, so the theory sound, it's just that we got the practice wrong. That's right. And, so, and they're still saying that. That's the reason we need to, to, to bring it up again. Um, and, and, and the problem with egalitarianism or this utopianism is you have to impose it. It's got to be done by force. So we have Islam using force. We have the progressive utopianism using force. And then we have Christianity. Now, Christianity divides into two heart, two kinds, to my mind. Uh, real Christianity, which is about love and humility uh, and, um, and, and the life, that, the countercultural life that Christ lived and invited us to follow. And corrupt Christianity, because, uh, and corrupt Christianity happens wherever Christianity, the Christians decide they want to piggyback on somebody else's values. And so the last 300 years, the piggybacking that's happened is, is on the back of nationalism. So many people look at, at the history of Christianity and they say, Gavin, you, know, you can't be serious. Look at the Inquisition. Look at the wars of religion in Europe. Uh, look at colonial oppression. You, you, you can't be serious that Christianity is as good as you say it is. To which my reply is, well, look at St. Francis. <laughs> there are moments when if you practice a thing properly, uh, it was G.K. Chesterton who said the trouble with Christianity is not that it's been tried and failed, but it's been tried and found too rather hard. When it works properly, it's astonishing. It gave us the hospices, it gave us schools, it gave us education, it gave us the freedom of slaves. When it piggybacks on another culture, which is what is happening at the moment, uh, in particular nationalism, uh, then it goes bad. So we have to distinguish between two kinds of Christianity. And once again, the, the real hope for our Judeo-Christian culture, in, to my mind, is a renewal of Christianity. But in our culture, many Christians have been seduced by the progressive utopia. And they say, well, you know, if people don't want to go by God, perhaps they shouldn't have to. Uh, if, they, if they want to develop their own potential uh, and be proud of their own um, achievements, you know, perhaps they, they can. Because they haven't read history and they haven't thought very clearly. So in this triangul triangulated fight, the problem for us is that Islam and the progressive left have joined forces over the last 30 years uh, to wipe out Christianity. And they're, in Europe, they're, they're succeeding uh, all too well, partly because Christians have been seduced by a, a, a kind of siren call of relativism and multiculturalism and don't see the trap that the whole of our culture is being ushered into. Um, and um, and the, the, the danger is that um, uh, we've just reached a point where to talk about Christianity in the public space is to be accused of hate crime and to be breaking the law. So our public, the, the evangelists are the swallows, are the canaries at the bottom of the mine. When the evangelists on the street corners can no longer what they do what they've been doing for 1500 years, which is 
telling the good news of Christ uh, in the public space, then you know that freedom is at an end. Because once that freedom goes, all the others will go. It's Judeo-Christian freedom that has allowed the minorities their place when Christianity is working well. Get rid of Christianity and you have the gulags instead. Well, hardly know where to start, but let me come to two of those issues. Uh, the first one is perhaps sometimes, uh, as Joseph said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. So I would surely would all agree with a very ugly, distorted view of Christianity that allowed people to burn one another at the stake, as happened here. There are memorials in this town mm. to people who were burnt at the stake. Appallingly bad, I would have thought, in terms of a proper understanding of Christian faith. Yet, it gave rise to the recognition that it was appalling. And I think our culture resolved in its earlier forms as it was working these things through, that we ought to allow people to have freedom of conscience, which surely is right. So to the examples you've given in Oxford um, are, are very good ones of uh, Christians siding with the state, killing Christians who didn't side with the state. The reason they're terrifyingly clear is because um, for a while you had, you had uh, Protestant martyrs as, as Mary uh, came in and reinstituted Catholicism in the country. And then um, when Mary died, you had Elizabeth and then you had Catholic martyrs. Um, because the state was now Protestant rather than Catholic. The issue is that if you allow the state to define Christianity, then Christians will act as instruments of the state um, and, and, and have always, always have done. Um, another example, I think, more, more prescient for us would be Germany in the 1930s. Uh, there you had the same issues. Uh, you have Bonhoeffer seeing the same things as we're talking about today, saying, um, the state appears to be offering to cut you a deal. It's quite a good deal. We need employment. We need social order. There are some people we'd like to get rid of too. Um, we, 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 we like a strong hand uh, with some, some Nietzschean and Wagnerian uh, undertones to the, the whole Germanic project. Um, and Bonhoeffer said this is very dangerous. Christians need to step right away from this. And so again Christians are divided into two. Those who stepped away from the state and those who were swallowed up by the state and did the state's will. Now. Um, the, the, Germany, the German example is, a, is an example closer to home that God can bring good out of bad. If the six million Jews had not died in the Holocaust, there would be no state of Israel for the rest of worldwide Jewry to have some kind of, of, of sanctuary. This is not to say the means justify the end. It is to make, to make your point that um, to the casual observer, casual is the wrong word, to the, to the observer on the sideline, Asking questions about good and evil, how do they relate? And the answer seems to be that they're in constant conflict. If good is not constantly wary, it will be overcome and polluted by evil. If, it, if good fails, is that the end of the story? And this was your point. No. Um, somehow good resurrects itself, or, good, or rather more, more properly, good gets resurrected. So you, you know, there's a story about the resurrection of goodness uh, in, in, in England. Um, it's true, though, that, that, that we stopped burning each other, um, but persecutions didn't stop. The next religious revival, revival was Wesley, and the Church of England simply closed its doors on it and, and, and kicked him out. Uh, there was another one with Newman, and the same thing happened. Um, but you're right, for those of us who believe in absolute goodness and the triumph of goodness, every time evil overcomes goodness, goodness gets resurrected. Now, what that should do is not make us complacent it, it just saves us from despair. Well, you mentioned there, to change gears again briefly for a moment, just drawing on what you, the comments you made a few moments ago, three revolutions, mm. which were bloody and cruel and awful, and which should teach us a very great deal about what not to do if we understood our history. There was another revolution, which is generally seen as a high point of establishing a framework of freedom. The American uh, Revolution and the Declaration of Independence, 1776. Whilst America, we look at it now and it seems to be a community at war with itself, we wonder where they've got to, uh, with apologies to my American friends, but it's hard to avoid that conclusion as you look at well, the debate there. Uh, nonetheless, they have been very committed to freedom, they've talked about it a lot, it was obviously deeply flawed because they kept slaves for a long time after they declared independence. But nonetheless, they have been champions of freedom, they've been prepared to seek to advance it around the rest of the world. What was different 
about the American Declaration of Independence, that revolution? I think I'd like to answer that by, by, with the observation that generals are always fighting the last battle or the last war. And so for the American Revolution, the last war it was fighting was, was uh, English monarchical oppression and taxes, especially taxes. Uh, and so the American Revolution set out to make sure they could build a society free of the, um, of, of the, the state interference that, that uh, the, uh, the English monarchical setup offered. It wasn't appalling um, oppression, but it was, it was irksome <laughs> and it was costly. Um, but I'd say there'd been five revolutions. I'd, I'd want to add to the American a fifth one, and that's the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s, because if we don't understand that, then we, first of all, we don't understand why the American Revolution's in trouble. But the, the fifth revolution um, has come a surprise to many people. So the, the Marxist Revolution set out to produce equality um, on, on the back of the French Revolution. Uh, and, and Marx wasn't a very good economist. Uh, he wasn't a very good socialist. He, he thought that the equality he could produce would be the equality of the proletariat bringing down the, the moneyed landed and ruling classes. And he thought there'd be enough energy and self-interest to, to make that happen. So the Russian Revolution was uh, a, a forced experiment to kickstart a proletarian revolution, which he expected then to follow elsewhere, and it never followed. So at the end of the experiment in the 1980s, uh, the, the Russian egalitarian revolution failed. Um, it failed because it misread politics and it misread ec economics. Um, it failed for other reasons too, but those are the, just two reasons at the moment. However, there were a group of intellectuals uh, committed to Marx's egalitarian project they're, they're, they're the utopians again. They're, they're, they've morphed away from the French Revolution and they're, they're still looking to bring... Uh, and they've looked at the Russian Revolution and they think it may not work. So they call the Frankfurt School uh, and they sit down in Germany and then many of them move to America and they say, if we can't produce a state-driven egalitarian society that's fair and just by Marxism 1.0, let's invent Marxism 2.0. And instead of coming at it by the economy, by, by, by the proletariat, we'll come at it by culture. And we, the, our major enemy is the family, the Judeo-Christian family, because, because the state can't become the parent for as long as there are real parents around. The state can't become your family for as long as there's a real family you belong to. So the, the, uh, whether, whether it was designed by, by intuitive accident or, or, or on purpose, and whether it's being driven now by, by people behind the scenes or it's simply evolved under its own steam, I don't know. But it came as four stages. And the first stage was feminism. Um, and, and feminism, of course, breaks down into at least three waves. The first wave is about women having the vote. Everyone was on board for that very quickly. Um, and it was, took off very early in Australia. The first yeah. place women were given the vote was in an Australian state. Uh, absolutely. Mm. Uh, and of course this goes hand in hand with a, with a developing technology and a medical system that soon produces birth control. And birth control changes everything because now um, women don't have to stay at home. And as soon as, as medicine and technology changes the rules, then we have women at work, second wave feminism. And everyone says, well, this is a good thing. Everyone except the children who may not be being brought up by their mothers. But then people said to themselves, well, it's about human choice. Maybe they'll manage just as well. Who knows yet? We'll see. So this, this experiment of second wave feminism. And then you have newspapers saying, can, can women have it all? Can they reach the top of the, the work tree and produce healthy children? And we've been arguing about that for 50 years. Um, and then third wave feminism comes with, with a real sting in the tail because um, Feminism is predicated first of all on equality with men, but, but then also on anger with men and on, and on the need to displace men, to get out from under men's feet, um, to produce a society where women are not controlled by men and, and get some degree of reparation for past wrong. So third wave feminism says, well, let's treat gender as a construct of the imagination. Basically, there's biology, you can't change your genitals, but you can change you can change your gender, what you dress in, how you, how you act, how you expect, how you handle things, how you interrelate. That's all in the head. So now utopianism goes into the head. Um, that's where your true freedom lies, in your head. And if enough people have freedom in their head, 
then these shackles of oppression that um, the Judeo-Christian tradition above all has imposed on us will begin to dissolve. So the, the, the downside of this is that, that there's always been a gender war because, because power has always been part of the human experience. And on the whole, men and women have, have, have tried to manage their, their, their gender struggles. They move from falling in love to struggling to getting cross with each other, back to falling in love. They, so it's a bit, a bit messy, but, but on the whole, there are, there are stages of mutuality and mutual need. But, but third wave feminism intends to end that mutual need, uh, along with the health of science. And, and uh, it, it ushers in gay marriage. For a while, uh, for about 10 or 15 years, I was a passionate LGBT activist because I bought into the, the oppressive narrative. I like my, my I'm, I'm a failed opera singer. Uh, I like theatres, I like musicals. I actually have a kind of, um, uh, I have a kind of cultural persona that makes me look like I might be gay. <laughs> and, um, I had a lot of gay friends and I felt very strongly for them and I wanted to protect them. So for a while I too was very much in favour of gay marriage until, until I began to discover that the gay marriage project wasn't WYSIWYG, it wasn't based on what you saw. It, it turned out that, that lesbian relationships were the most violent and unstable of all relationships. We have this from Scandinavian research to people who think this is just a piece of, of, of slipped in homophobia. It turns out that, that the, my, my, my gay friends in my university town who came to talk over their woes with me said, well, you know, um, I'm, in a, I'm in a stable, faithful, monogamous gay relationship but I wish he wouldn't sleep away eight times a month. The, the maximum is four. And so I would say, wait a moment, you're in a, a stable, exclusive relationship and, and you both get to sleep away four times a month? Yes, that's, that's, we're men. We're, we're men unrestrained by women. Uh, it's only women who restrain men who, if they could, would sleep around as much as they can get away with because that's how men are built. So women, women cut a deal and they say, if you want the comforts of home life, you stop that. <laughs> um, but in the gay male community, that's not the case until people get older and a bit more sedate. Uh, and so what we discover is that both the male gay community and the female gay lesbian community are not in fact these, these foundationally healthy, solid, safe places where you can build family life on. That's the narrative, but it isn't true. Uh, the, the, the place where it becomes most true for children to best flourish is in with their biological parents. But, but here's the thing, this was a plea for justice and equality, and the whole gay narrative and gay marriage narrative now uses children as a commodity to legitimise gay marriages and gay relationships. Well, that's the most terrible abuse of the human rights of children who ought to start off by having at least the possibility of access to their biological parents. And then it turns out that we, we discover in America that there are a number of children brought up in gay marriages and gay relationships who are now suing the state by saying, look, this was a profoundly unhealthy, destabilizing and, and damaging experience for us. You had no right to experiment on us like this and the outcome has been very poor. Now we're still arguing about this because we're, it, it's a recent experiment, but one of the problems about discussing it is if you, if you raise it in these terms, you're accused of being phobic. So the reason I mentioned that, that I was a, an LGBT activist 10 minutes ago is to try and give myself a free pass from that, well, he's just homophobic. You know, there's something wrong with him. He, he, he doesn't understand, he doesn't love, he doesn't like. Um, and and that, that isn't true. The interesting thing then was to say, well, now, now look at what's happening in society. First of all, we got feminism bringing in the new, as, as the vanguard of utopian equality. And it had some good effects and some bad effects. And then we have gay marriage, and this is very recent. Uh, we're not quite sure if we can judge the effects yet. So people like me are saying, actually, guys, this is, this is built on very thin ice and, and the outcomes we can see are not looking promising. Uh, and the rest of society says, cool it. Let's, let's, let's give people some slack and see what happens. And as we're doing that, the next, the next stage in cultural Marxism develops and it's transsexualism. So it's this, it's this fluid identity, it's gender identity. And this looks like freedom. But actually, gender dysphoria also looks like mental illness. Uh, now, how do we tell the difference between freedom and mental illness? Well, um, William James was very good on this. He was a, one of the early professors of, of both psychology uh, and philosophy uh, in America. And he said, just look to the outcomes. The outcomes will tell you whether, Jesus said something similar, but let's stick with William James. William James said, let's look to the outcomes. 
Now, the outcomes are that the, the mental health of our children hasn't been very good in the last 30 or 40 years. It's really quite a serious problem. It's been quite a serious Everywhere in the West. Absolutely. Uh, and whether it's, it's, it's kids uh, smoking skunk, which, um, which, which causes real problems with, with, with paranoia, or whether it's, it's um, uh, the uncertainty of, of sexual freedom and responsibilities and the damage that go with it, and the ghastly abortion rate. Uh, 7 million, 8 million in England, 60 million in America. Um, the cost of our new libertarian experiment have not been good. But suddenly, with the rise of transsexualism, we've moved from 1.07% of society experiencing a discomfort between the biology of the body and, and the, the, the psychogendered geography of the brain. To, 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 to an exponential increase. And actually, uh, the one thing you might give an adolescent to cling on to for some kind of mental stability is their gender, when everything else is up in, in, in the air. And now we've taken that, that stability away from them. And the, um, uh, the explosion of gender dysphoria is, is quite extraordinary, as if our kids didn't have enough mental confusion and, and trouble. This new uh, element in cultural Marxism is causing the most dreadful pain. And then you get a number of... But wouldn't, just, just to pull you up there, wouldn't there be those who would say, well, that was because it wasn't polite to talk about it before we suppressed it. We've now given people freedom to explore there's, their... Yeah, there's an element of truth in that. Um, of course there is. Um, there have always been a small, tiny proportion of people who suffered some kind of aberrational, either, uh, either biological, it's a tiny, tiny proportion, uh, or mental. Yes, we, we've, um, human beings, uh, uh, we, we come in, in the widest variations. But um, the more you bring into question our frailties, our, our, uh, our, our oddnesses, our eccentricities, particularly if you're right at the end of the scale, the greater uncertainty there is. And people don't manage very well with uncertainty. But if you compare the two, two things side by side, as you quite rightly do, then, um, then the number of people who, uh, who function perfectly adequately, even if they were at that end of the spectrum, uh, compared to now, uh, is enormously different. Now, now you, people are given the freedom to explore. They're given the freedom to be told they may what they seem, uh, and their functionality is, is really very badly flawed. And, and the terrifying thing is that a number of us who've looked at cultural Marxism say, well, okay, first of all, feminism, and then gay marriage, and then transsexualism, and the next thing coming down the road seems to be paedophilia. So if, you, if for example, you look at a, a very recent piece of, Toronto, of government propaganda in Ontario, where you have a very nice uh, teacher telling children 8, 9, and 10 that they are to be allies of gay pride, what you can't escape is, is the is the fact that, that the gay pride movement defines itself by sexual attraction, by sexual appetite. I mean, that's what it's all about. Uh, it, it, there's a bit of romance thrown in, but, but if you look at the gay pride uh, marches, um, it's, it's, it's rampant sexual activity dressed up in the most lurid way. So now you say to eight or nine-year-old children, children, you need, to, you need to approve of this. We're going to be allies of gay pride allies of the gay movement. And bright, intelligent children say, well, this is about sexualization. So you're introducing adult sexualization to children eight or nine or 10 in order to get them to support a political program. Um, and then what you discover is, in fact, that we're, we're finding out now that, that the covert paedophiles have been immediately jumping on to the LGBT bandwagon saying, hey, we're not, we're, we too are suffering from a form of disability. Don't criminalise us because we're attracted to children. It's, it's a form of, of, of gender disability. We get to jump on the bandwagon. And, and the terrifying thing that, that we're about to find, and it's, it's beginning to stir now, is that this whole assault on Judeo-Christian values where you have within the family of a man and a woman bringing up their own children as the basic template, uh, producing the greatest, the best stability, uh, the best performing children, the most stable outcomes for social glue. Um, that is being washed away in a tide of alternative ideology and actually even being, being treated as somehow limited or bad. So where does all this amount to? Well, if it was just a new expression 
of, um, of, of cultural exploration, we might be able to say, okay, let's see what happens. Let's treat it as an experiment. The sleeping around in the 60s, it didn't do a lot of good. The, uh, the, the, the drug taking in the 70s and 80s, it didn't do a lot of good. We now have the evidence to say some of these freedoms were actually quite damaging. The danger now is that if you stand up and say, I don't think marriage, gay marriage, does our children a lot of good. I don't think it even does necessarily the people who engage in it a lot of good. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm strongly for civil partnerships, by the way, because they're civil rights. But to hijack marriage is to move it away from their heteronormative into a different category. Then you get accused of, 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 of homophobia. And if you say, I, I don't think that introducing transsexualism into the public place is, is necessarily good for people. Like, for example, a, a postgraduate researcher in Bath, whose job was to help people transition. So the whole of his life, his professional job, was being helping people in this movement. And then he discovered, as he was doing a postgraduate um, a degree at Bath University, uh, that the outcomes for people transitioning were really very poor. The level of regret was unacceptably high. So the thing he'd been trying to help people do as a matter of, of, of human dignity, of, of personal freedom, of, 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 of gender integrity, turned out to be damaging people. So he began to say, my research suggests that the level of regret that we are discovering in transgendered people is too high to be acceptable. So they threw him off the program. They, they, they threw him out of the university. Uh, he's not a welcome voice in the public media. He's been closed down. You could never accuse him of being transphobic. He's actually an expert. But anyone who's, who, who criticizes uh, whether it's gay marriage uh, or, 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 or trans rights uh, is closed down as being homophobic. And, and then the same thing is also true when you, if you move over to the whole Islamic thing. If you criticize uh, Islam in the public space, you are the Metropolitan Police now. I've got a guideline saying, if you make a connection between Islam and violence, you are guilty. So if I was to stand up on a street and say, hey guys, listen to me, I've been thrown off the social media. Uh, I've broken the, the conditions of YouTube and Facebook and Twitter, as I would do if I, if I hold these views. And I say, listen to me on a street corner. Islam is quite dangerous. It's really quite violent. And, uh, and, and trans rights is dangerous to people, to our children. We're pumping with hormones and cutting bits off them. Don't do these things. I'd be arrested within minutes. So, so we go back to the beginning of your conversation. Where, what's happening to our freedoms? And the answer is we are being overwhelmed by a tsunami of cultural change that is untested, uh, appears to be potentially very dangerous. And as we stand up to have a public conversation about it, we've been shut up already. Mm. There's an aspect of this which, which I mean, there's no other way to put it, makes me very angry. I actually think we're using our children now or making them victims in our culture wars and it's not so long ago that would have been seen as abhorrent. Parents would have said it's our responsibility and it's our right. Or put it the other way around, it's our right and our responsibility to raise our children. It strikes me that there's not much pushback in many Western cultures against this creeping statism where parental authority and obligations even are pushed to one side, where children sometimes are encouraged to do things at school on the basis that their parents need not and even must not know about. Well, and, and, and one of the reasons why, that's exactly right, and one of the reasons why that happens is because one of the other ambushes we've fallen into is this false dichotomy between the right and the left. Uh, on my Twitter feed I say, I'm, I'm anti-fascist. Uh, I am, I'm anti-state control, whether it's, um, whether it's, it's the control of, 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 um, of race, one race of another, or of, of um, culture or class, which is of the left. So the left and the right are in fact, um, uh, have a certain symmetry about them. Um, but what the left have done is to say, if you criticize us, we're gonna call you a fascist. We're gonna place you on the far right of the political spectrum. Even though you hate fascism, and even though you completely and utterly abhor state control in the name of race. Um, so the, the middle ground, which is where most people lie in fact, and where the argument ought to be coming from, has been taken from under our feet. And therefore, if you, if you make the point you've made and say to the left, look, you're being hypocritical. Uh, you, who once got so exercised by, by the Dickensian practice of sending children up, uh, up chimneys to clean them, you who once got exercised by child prostitution and, and child forced labor, 
uh, you have no problem with, with uh, taking the rights of the, of the pre-born away from them. You're happy to kill children in a womb and you're also happy to, 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 to farm children out as a social experiment and remove them from at least one and maybe both of their biological parents in order to support somebody else's venture of gender identity. How has this got anything to do with children's rights? And at that point, well, you're called a fascist. Um, you mustn't question the progressive values of the left because um, this is about a particular kind of equality. And, and that's the problem with, with, with progressive utopianism. It's always about one particular kind of equality. And, and, and in the same way that I began by saying, I'm hesitant to claim freedom because I recognize my freedom. My freedom to drive fast may result in my killing other people, uh, killing, taking away the pedestrian of freedoms. Um, and so, so to how do you deal with inequality? The way the progressive left has always done it is by, uh, is by taking other people's freedoms away from them and by exercising a level of debilitating control. So, um, and we don't get to have this conversation because to take the left on is to be labelled as fascist or phobic. Two complete fictions which are, which are untrue and unchallenged. Two things to unpack there. Let's uh, uh, come to them uh, in reverse order. We'll talk about equality and what it really is because it seems to me that pursued in the wrong way, it ends up mitigating against freedom. But before we do that, one of the things that uh, strikes me, uh, you have talked freely and we're seeing it in Australia too, uh, the way that, that about the trend towards trying to, if you like, clamp down on, make illegal, ensure that people do not engage in hate speech. But what absolutely amazes me is the hypocrisy that lies at the heart of this, because it seems to me that um, the radical elites, if I can put them that way, who control so much of the public debate, say nothing about the vicious hatred that is peddled on social media. <coughs> it is staggering stuff. And I think it is very intimidating for people who hold a moderate or a conservative view. I remember, uh, I remember when hate speech was involved or hate crime was, was first put on the statute books in this country. Um, I initially thought I was going to be a lawyer. So, so two stages in answer to your question. First of all, when Tony Blair introduced the notion of hate crime here, I look round to see why aren't people jumping up and down at this astonishing shift from, if you like, the collective objective. I know that's partly a contradiction in terms. Philosophically, this is difficult territory. Why have we moved from the collective objective to the subjective? So the collective objective was the man on the Clapham omnibus. That was a test in the British courts. If you asked the irregular person, man, woman, uh, uh, on a bus traveling, you packed them up by random and said, use your common sense, what do you think? This would be the, the, uh, the, the um, perspective that undergirded the rule of law in this country. What Tony Blair did uh, as an architect of this cultural revolution, uh, and I think a much more canny architect than we give him credit for, is he interiorized crime. So he, 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 he put it into the person's head. So the only, the, the way, what, what then happened was the, the, a, a, you, 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 you tell whether a crime has been committed by whether someone feels a crime has been committed. And, and there is no collective objectivity. Well now the first thing you ought to say is how sane is the person upon whose judgment you're relying. But, but to, to give over the autonomy to decide what is a crime to the so-called victim whose sanity you can't judge was, was the door that opened all of this. And again, there's been no kickback, no fight back. The first thing we need to do in our country is to repeal the Equalities Act and get rid of this appalling, ludicrous, insane legislation that defines hate in this way. Uh, and then, of course, as you quite rightly say, uh, any kickback from the centre um, uh, to say, look, the hate actually isn't with us at all, it's with you. The hate is on the left. There's, there's an old kind of um, psychological maxim to do with projection that you know, when people start shouting and making a great noise, they, they may be reflecting what's in them more than the object of their, of, of their analysis. And in this case, uh, the, the hate is almost all on the left. Uh, and, and we've had for the last five or ten years examples of, uh, of, of the uh, libertarian centre being hounded by the progressive, usually either, either, either simply politically progressive or LGBT politically progressive uh, mob. 
who have had them thrown out of work, thrown off Twitter, thrown out of pub social media. The hate, in my judgment, is almost all on the left. It is quite extraordinary. It, it, it's of a level, I think, now where you'd have to say it wouldn't take months to, to make it break out into actual violence. And it does seem to me that uh, there was, if part of the genius of Western society was to establish ways by which we accommodate differences, so we stopped hanging, uh, burning people at stake, we stopped hanging them, we gave up the guillotine, we saw the horrors of the gulag archipelagos and the salt mines and what have you for people who held a minority view in places like uh, Russia. But now we've invented our own guillotine. We can kill people socially and mentally, it seems, by social media. We have. And behind what you just described uh, lies the issue of whether or not there is progress. So you, you, you implied there was progress to begin with. Look, look what we've done, look what we've achieved, look where we've got. But in actual fact, the moments where minorities have been safe, the moment where the minority has been able to speak out, they're pretty precious and few and far between. It's not been the normal human experience. It, it absolutely hasn't. And um, we had it for a while in Europe. It, it came and went, and there were always exceptions to it. The Jews were the exceptions. In Hitler, the gays were the exceptions. Um, uh, and the gypsies have been the exceptions. These have been the categories we, who, who fared least well when it was being practiced best. We never even managed it very well. But we managed it for a few moments of, in, of, of, of genuine enlightenment. Um, but, but as a Christian, I would say, look, I don't believe in progress. Uh, I believe in technological progress. I'm very fond of anaesthetics. Um, I'm fond of antibiotics, so it looks like we're screwing that one up. Uh, I, I like plastic until we, we, we put in microballs and shove it into the oceans. Uh, uh, but actually, I, on the whole, I don't believe that human beings are capable of moral progress. What we're capable of is, and this is the reason I'm a Christian, we're capable of being saved. And as we understand the terms by which we're saved, we share them with other people. So the terms on which we're saved is we're saved. We, we see something going wrong and we change direction. Uh, we get forgiven and we offer it to other people. So we, inv we, we then invite other people to share in this largesse. Hey, do you want to change direction? Let's, let's give you space to do that. Rather than hang you, let's, let's see if we can give you a, a better and a new life through education. Um, I've been forgiven. Uh, and, uh, I can forgive you. Society can forgive you. We, this is the, the life of second chances. But it's absolutely predicated on Judeo-Christianity. It does not exist in Islam, where they cut your hands off for various things, where they stone you for various other things. It is not a Sharia principle, this forgiveness and this second chance. Nor is it a secular progressive principle. It, 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 it was not to be found in Mao's China. It wasn't to be found in Stalin's Russia. It's a very precious attribute of Judeo-Christian society. And one of the things I want to say to people who are listening who are not Christians is that although Christianity has had its bad patches, when, as I suggested, it, it's piggybacked on other value systems, uh, at the heart of, a, of, the heart of, a, of a, an ideology which sanctifies human beings and says they are not for disposal, Human beings are not disposable. They, they have the mark of God upon them. And however they behave, they must be treated with respect and generosity. An ideology that says you can be forgiven uh, endlessly, an ideology that says we believe you can come good in the end and we'll do all we can to give you the space to do that, that's an ideology that provides freedom of speech and freedom of behavior. And there isn't another one. Looking back in world history, there isn't another culture that does that. And we're about, by attacking Judeo-Christianity in the way we've done, on the grounds that people are lazily preferring this sloppy, non-existent, egalitarian fascism of the left, they will lose their freedom of speech. And even if they don't like, even if they don't want to be saved, even if they don't want to go to heaven and they don't want God and they don't want the, the life of Christ in them, they ought to want their freedom of speech and they're going to lose it. There's a great irony in that, isn't there? Because uh, properly understood, Christianity says that all have worth and dignity. In fact, that uh, no one is more valuable or worthy than another. At the same time as it denies the modern idea that we're, we should insist on equal outcomes. So there is a rich irony there because in reality, the modern left is creating whole new hierarchies of worthiness and unworthiness. Absolutely. 
And th at the very time, as they accuse Christians and people of traditional belief uh, of um, being in, uh, in, in support of inequality. So you're absolutely right. Uh, Christians believe in equality. We believe we've, we're equally flawed. And, and the key, I think, to dealing with, with equality is actually to come at it by via inequality. One of the reasons I wanted to be a lawyer was I wanted to deal with inequality, and particularly those who didn't have access to justice. Um, so, uh, I mean, in, in Christian theological terms, there's, there's something called the, uh, uh, the cataphatic and the ap apophatic way, the via negativa, the via positiva, for those who like the technical language. Um, what I want to suggest is if you, if you try and go at it by, by creating equality, you fail. Yep. If you go at it by, by dealing with inequality, you can have some partial success. And that again is the difference between the right and the left politically. Uh, I don't associate myself with the right. I disassociate myself with the left. Uh, I, politically, I want a bit of both. I, 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 I want um, to, to cherry pick uh, the, best, the best of both. But Personally, to be honest, I'm not certain that any of the old labels work anymore. I, I don't think... Because ambivalence in language has been the postmodernist's best friend. Absolutely. I'm not sure what words mean anymore. Well, you're quite right. And what we're using is uh, we're using an image from the French court where, uh, where the progressives sat on the left of the king and people who wanted the status quo sat on the right. And we've taken that image and we're applying it so bluntly to, ever, to, to, to our present situation. You're right. We, we ought, it'd be better if we didn't use right and left. Um, the other thing you quite rightly and so importantly touch on is the meaning of words. So equality doesn't mean equality anymore. Um, and if we were going to deal with equality, we would be doing it via inequality. Diversity doesn't mean diversity. What diversity means is let's get rid of the old cultural norms and welcome in anything that isn't Judeo-Christian. Um, uh, tolerance doesn't mean tolerance anymore. It means let's get rid of the old cultural agreements and welcome in anything that isn't Judeo-Christian. And you can test it by standing up and saying, hey, I'm a Christian and I have these views. See how much diversity law and planning helps you then. Not at all. There are some wonderful YouTube skits of Christians going in for jobs in front of diversity and equality officers. And the moment they discover they're Christians being ushered out of the room. So tolerance, diversity, equality. Uh, these are all uh, magic words that mean one thing to the cultural left and mean an another entirely when they're, they're tested in the robust heat of the light of, of social intercourse. Interesting uh, quote from our longest serving Prime Minister in Australia. He said, democracy is not so much a machine as a spirit in which we acknowledge that people have different capabilities. They end up in different stations reflecting different abilities and indeed different interests and pursuits. I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. But we recognise that under heaven all souls are equal and that lies at the basis of our freedom. Um, yeah, I, see, I think that I, th I think that's making a mistake. I would say so. We welcome this incredible. Uh, the, 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 we celebrate this great difference, and then what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that those who are differently strong don't get to practice inequality on those who are differently weak. We're not going to. We can't produce equality, but we can spot inequality, and inevitably, in any society where there's freedom. The people who are more competent, I mean, Jordan Peterson is very good on, on the whole business of, of, of recognising competence. Um, the people who are more competent are going to gather together resources that make sure they're OK. And people who are less competent are going to have fewer resources. And the reason I'm not on the right or the left is because I think there is a role for a state to offer some, for the community uh, through the state, to offer some kind of arbitration. Oh, I don't think he was in conflict with that at all. No, no, no. But, but what I'm saying was, so I don't think he was either. But, but I was taking the language you use and saying, trying to sharpen it up. Because uh, he slipped in the word equality of souls. Mm. And I, I just think the moment you use the word equality, it is so dangerous, so difficult to tie down, well, so let's, difficult to let's, apply. Let's tease that out. None of us would be against the quality of opportunity right. or recognising in the end that all have dignity and worth. Absolutely. So we start at that point. Yep. We then move to surely an understanding that... And we have to do things to facilitate equality of opportunity. Absolutely. We have to build steps. Oh, absolutely. Okay, we're agreed. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, surely then we move on to a situation where in practice a great deal was achieved whilst equality of opportunity has been pursued. But what is really interesting is that after a while it seems to morph into increasingly, if you like, authoritarian approaches to try and ensure equality. And what you end up with then, and this is the great irony, surely, of the Soviet and uh, other communist experiments, is you end up with massive 
inequality. And so I think it might have been your greatest Prime Minister of the last century, Churchill, who said something like, if you pursue freedom as your end goal, you'll end up with a reasonable degree of equality. But if you pursue equality of outcome as your end goal, you'll end up losing a lot of freedom. Well, that's exactly right. And so few people have made a distinction between uh, equality of opportunity and equality of outcome. And the reason it's gone wrong is because the, the, the people who've been uh, whose job, whose calling, whose energy it has been to, to, to do the equality stuff have been so hooked on equality of outcome that they've wrecked it. They, they've completely wrecked it. There, were, there have been some extraordinary experiments in equality of opportunity within, our, within English society um, uh, over the last 100 years or so. But the moment it got into the hands of the progressive left, they, they were not prepared to to stop with equality of opportunity, they wanted to force equality of outcome. And by what they then did was they removed equality of opportunity. And they didn't deliver equality of outcome, which is why it ends up, as you said, in the Gulag. So the very people whose vision and job it was did it worse, because if you like, there were two stages to it. The second stage is, is duff and doesn't work. And they weren't prepared to admit that the first stage was worth it on itself, but by its own. This is all quite relatively recent history. Yes, I mean, here we are in totally. Europe. It's not so long ago that we saw people in their minions dying in the pursuit of some of these uh, fine sounding objectives. Why have we scrubbed it so quickly out of our history? How have people got away oh. with that? Well, that's such an interesting question. Um, so then we have to decide, are we talking, are we talking politics? Are we talking It's worth philosophy? remembering that Marx himself said, that are people deprived of their history are easily persuaded? Absolutely. Yes, it's the first thing, it's the first thing you need to do. And what do they stop doing? They stop teaching history to our kids, so they have no idea where they are, uh, in our educational system anyway. They stop teaching linear history. They, they, they teach smorgasbord history, which is not the same thing at all. Um, I wish I knew the answer to your question. Um, and I, I keep on looking for a language that will describe this. In the end, the language that satisfies me most, or I think tells the most truth, is, is the language I use as a Christian. Uh, and I'm sorry this makes it inaccessible to some people, but actually my, my best atheist friends understand me very well. John, John Gray is one of our greatest intellectuals in England at the moment. He's a professor of philosophy. He's just written a book called Seven Types of Atheism. Uh, and he's very rude about, about Dawkins. In fact, he says Dawkins isn't really an atheist. He's, he's a parasite on, on deism. Uh, he, you know, he defines himself completely by the God he doesn't believe in. So that, that makes him a sort of inverted Christian rather than a real atheist. But in his book, uh, John Gray says that, that, that um, he has no difficulty at all uh, understanding Christian values. He just doesn't share the cosmological, epistemological, metaphysical assumptions that lie behind it. Um, but we find ourselves describing the same kind of reality. So I have a, a number of very good atheist friends from my time at university. Uh, and, and we like to discuss together to pull each other's ideas around. But I don't hear from within atheism or even from within politics a proper meta-narrative of what's going on in our society. Uh, instead, what I see is a conflict between good and evil. And whether it's expressing itself in this tri tri um, uh, tripartite fight between Islam, Christianity and, and, and progressive politics, or whether it's doing it between uh, nationalism and the individual conscience, uh, or whether it's, it's, it's doing it um, in terms of the civilizing missionaries in Europe trying to stop the pagans doing child sacrifice, uh, uh, or, or celebrating, celebrating the shedding of blood for its own sake, or, or whether it's doing trying to save the pre-born from, from the Holocaust of the abortion industry. Uh, good and evil is what is what most easily describes what we're going on, what's happening here. And and uh, human beings are a bit, to my mind, the metaphysical struggle is a bit like the biological struggle. Uh, as a human being, I'm surrounded by germs, by viruses, uh, by 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 dangerous um, phenomena that will attack my 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 sort of medico ecosystem. And if I if I eat and drink the right things and I get enough sleep, uh, on the whole, I can see them off. But but if I compromise my natural a biological invulnerability, um, or if I sit in an aeroplane in an air conditioning system with five people who have the most terrible viruses, I'm likely to get sick <laughs> at the end of it. And uh, I see the Judeo-Christian experience as providing a degree of, of um, uh, not invulnerability, but, but, but good, good health from moral dis-ease. 
the further you get away from that, the more vulnerable you are to moral and spiritual dis-ease. And so I would chart an X and Y uh, um, chart and the, uh, the, the less Christianity you have in a society, the more you will have moral dis-ease. And the more Christianity you have, the less you will have moral and psychological disease. And I, 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 that, that to me is a way of describing different parts of our history. And so one of the reasons why this has happened at the moment is because the Judeo-Christian tradition got tired. Um, it's almost as if the Second World War completely exhausted our culture. Um, nationalism did a great deal of, you know, the competing nations that ended up in the, uh, the most, you know, the most stupid, appalling and hard to defend First World War. It, it kind of, that floored our culture and exhausted yes. us. I'm sure and then, that's right. Then people said, well, you know, we've had a really bad time. Uh, you know, our brothers, our fathers, they, they, they've, they've been killed. And, and then we've, Victorianism was a bit heavy handed. Let's have a great time. And so for the 20s and 30s, they did. They took the eye off the ball. And, and they hadn't won a piece. They had just enjoyed a momentary oasis. It's almost as if instead of traveling through the desert, the, devil, the desert travels under you. And the oasis was carried away. And suddenly we had these two appalling totalitarian uh, regimes at, at attack uh, Western culture again. Uh, and Western culture, by the skin of its teeth, managed to draw itself together and fight them off. And then in the 1950s, collapsed it, exhausted again. And once again, the siren call was, well, you deserve a good time. Have a nice time in the 1960s. And so with, with a pill and with drugs. Um, and, and I have to say, without the rejuvenation of Christian spirituality. At this point, I look back and, and I, I blame our, some of our Christian forebears. And you, you mistook Christianity for, for bourgeois morals. You mistook the triumph of the kingdom of heaven for the defeat of fascism. Uh, you mistook uh, social order for, for spiritual rejuvenation. And you sat back on your laurels. And then, and then you piggybacked on the back of relativism uh, and rationalism and you gave up the, the, the mysterious and the miraculous in your own faith. And I'm afraid where we've got to, I see as, as the result of the failure of people who should have been more Christian than they are. And in one sense, this encourages me when people look at, to me and say, well, you know, you, so you've got four degrees, you should be a bit more of an intellectual, you should stop all this belief in the transcendent and the mystical and the transformative and the miraculous. And I say, you know, we got here because my Christian forebears sat too light to all this. I'm not going to make the same mistake. I'm going for 100% full-blown, high-octane Christianity because, frankly, that's the only thing, as I look back, that saved people. Saints have saved society. Sanctity, transformation, conversion. Look at John Newton, the slave trailer, whether the author of Amazing Grace. It's still the most commonly sung hymn in the world today. And so it should be, because, because it tells... Those words are much more powerful, I suspect, than many of the singers <laughs> stop to think about. I think they do. So there we are. That, that's so so I, I blame Christians for the present situation. <laughs> Gavin, thank you very much. I just hope your society continues to allow you to say those things, because there's no substitute for healthy debate John, and trying to understand others. It won't. I, I'm, I'm already in breach of social media small print. Uh, the things that I believe and want to say in public will cause me to be arrested for the breach of the peace if people say stop him to the police. Uh, I'll then have to decide whether when I'm shut down on social media or in the public space whether I continue to make a fuss. If I make a fuss I'll be penalised. Uh, I'll have to decide, as many people will, whether or not these values are worth giving up our freedoms for and maybe our lives for. Because the people who want to close us down are not playing games. They're not playing by the same rules. They don't have the same goals. And actually, um, they, they, they'd be very keen to have us silenced and incarcerated. We've seen the beginnings of that already. This isn't self-pity or paranoia or narcissism. This is a social reading. But I have to say, for as long as I can find the courage and the support of my friends and my community, I'll go on telling the truth. I learned that as a teenager reading Orwell and Huxley. I made the decision long ago. Well, thank you. I, I find those closing remarks very sobering. I do note, perhaps to finish on a note of hope then, that there's been an enormous interest in the challenging of what has become the new orthodoxy by people like Jordan Peterson. He's not alone, but he's the one that people are talking about at the moment. I saw him in Australia recently. Mm. Mm. Ironically, I watched him with a meeting of people where there were two card-carrying members of the hard left 
in an audience that I was carefully watching. If they hadn't recognised they've got a problem with overreach, they're not reading the signs very well. If we had a Jordan Peterson in every university, we'd be okay. But we've got one. <laughs> Uh, and, and, if, and if Jordan Peterson manages to wake up the slumbering consciences of the non-progressively bamboozled and propagandized, we may have some hope. But education is completely in the hands of the progressives. The police are in the hands of the progressives. The legal system and the laws we are passing are in the hands of the progressives. Even the medical system uh, with the values that it's practicing, both in terms of abortion now and euthanasia soon to come, is in the hands of the progressives. John, where are our footholds in, in polite, civilised society from which we can marshal uh, our, our support and common sense? We are so far on the back foot, it would be really foolish for us to imagine that one Jordan Peterson can change a whole culture. The left have been at this now for 40 or 50 years, working immensely hard and with great sophistication. My hope lies, I think, in Russia and China. One of the things that appears to be happening is that in Russia, where in 1989 there were no Christians, <laughs> they'd all been sent to prison or mental hospital or killed. Uh, there is now, I think, over 50% of Russian adults self-identify as Christians. Um, I don't know what kind of Christians they are, but the fact that there are any, is a miracle. In China at the moment, where there shouldn't be any at all, uh, there are more Christians numerically in China than, than, than many other parts of the world. They divide into state-sponsored and underground. But the fact is, um, human beings will, where they have courage and hunger, will respond to this, to the good news that's been implicit in much of what we've been saying. We have a choice, however. Uh, in Russia and China, they're responding. If in Europe, they decide they want drugs and comfort and control, more than they want their freedoms. Uh, they'll get drugs, comfort and control. But we've been given choice and that's one of the most precious gifts we have. And some of us are determined to go on exercising it. Thank you.